coming to the end, very end. We survived. Um, <laughs> we have three classes. In the first one, we're going to, con to continue where we stopped in terms of mission. Then second one, we're going to a different field, uh, the issue of churchless spirituality. And then the third class, we're going to have a summary of the entire module and recommendations. So we are going to put things into perspective and, and see what we actually learned, what was this all about. Um, and then if you have further questions regarding your assignments, uh, regarding exam and everything, uh, this can come in the end then, okay? So we define mission as a whole life participation in the movement of God towards the restoration of the defected world. It's a whole life participation in the movement of God. And then we said in order for this to really become true for Adventism, we need to, we need to make four modifications. We have four proposals that we want to implement in the light of our improved pneumatic vision, okay, in the light of better understanding of what the Holy Spirit is doing among us. What happens if we try to explore the implications of this vision to the concrete life of church? Particularly three divisive issues we, we studied, the issue of church structure, ministry, and mission. So these are the three, uh, four, four proposals that we are going to propose today. Yesterday we talked about the fact that we need to change the outlook, the whole way we perceive mission. This is not a mission of ours or a mission of God, sorry, it's a mission for God done by the church, but a mission of God. So shift from the emphasis from the church as the main actor of mission to God. This is Missio Dei. And the moment we start to think constantly, continually to open our vision uh -huh, and ask the question, what God is doing okay, around us? What's, what's, what's He up to? What is He up to around us in the world where we live? Um, that's the moment where we're going to enhance the vision of mission. We're not going to just think locally in terms of my own initiative, but we'll think about how this fits the bigger picture. Okay, so the replacement of the ecclesiocentric outlook with the God-centered one. And then we started a text where Jesus actually explained to us that technically he can do nothing by himself, but Father shows him what he's doing because he loves him and then he can join Father and he can do great work. And this is the, the schematic presentation that we had, how we become part of the work of God, who, he who reveals to us things which often bring us to the crisis of faith, and uh, which requires require from us to adjust our lifestyle in order to accommodate God's plans. And then once we obey God's instructions and His revelation to us, then we really experience Him working around us. Okay? So we are becoming part of His movement around us towards the restoration of this world. Now, today we came to the second proposal, which is revising our attitudes. So we need to adapt or adopt uh, of a, uh, adaptation of a more inclusive attitude towards others. Why is this necessary? Yesterday we had a group which was actually reading this part of our handout. Uh, how would you summarize this? Uh, what are the arguments, what are the thoughts that you had in relation to that? So changing the attitudes. If you can find it in your handout so we can start from there. So this is point number two. Yes. Yes, it seems that this language about us and them, us as remnant and them as Babylon, if it's not qualified further, if it's left on its own, creates some certain kind of tension. We always define ourselves to be better than somebody else. You know, we have the truth, we know it, but Catholics don't know it or somebody else, you know, about this particular truth. Uh, so this, there is al always a tendency of us trying to caricature our, so to say, enemy in order to boost our own identity and boost our, our own theological project. And the moment we don't critique certain things around us, the, that's the moment we kind of lose the sense, okay, so what's our mission then? If we, if, if we don't critique openly Catholics, what do we then do? I mean, 
uh, Ellen G. White was warning people. Of, um, she wrote uh, great, great Controversy, and she said this is primarily intended for the people who are traveling, who need to make sense of the world, not necessarily for sharing it to the outside world. You know, um, it clashes our current initiatives to really share it. Uh, many people have benefited, but primarily the, its intention is actually to help God's people to see where they, how they fit in within the larger sphere, within, within, the, within the larger controversy that, that exists. But then she says, um, instead of critiquing people and trying to point towards the wrongs and everything what we are doing, rather preach the original, preach the truth. And those people who are not doing it, they will, their conscience will rebuke them. You, you're not here to be the judge, you know. So she was advising against this anti-Catholic sentiment, the way we should treat that. Even though we do believe that certain things are wrong in the whole system, um, we need to be careful that not to approach it from this self-righteous attitude, uh, from the higher moral horse, and then try to uh, lecture them all what, what the truth is. You know, we present the best we know, in light of that vision, we can then see a little um, differences between us and others and how things could be improved. We can enter a meaningful dialogue. Yes? It's not so much an introduction because I have a lived experience myself, you know, after my conversion. Mm -hmm. In the past, it was giving me some only seven day Adventist book, but mm -hmm. I did, you know, got some gift from different denominations, you know, different books. Yes. But he said to me, don't read those because mm -hmm. you know, just stick to these ones. Yes. But at the end of the day, if I don't read them, how would I know? Yes, yes. How can I engage with conversation and yes. to grow more with yes. dialogue that you just mentioned here? Yes. And I think, you know, we have to put down our uh, this kind of ideology yes. and go and, and mingle and re go with them, like salt, for example, mm -hmm. but still we don't lose our saltiness. Yes, exactly. Very good. And uh, remember when we talked about um, Second Vatican Council and a document called Lumen Gentium or Gentium, depending how you read this Latin phrase. Yes, uh, it says there, um, previously they were talking about uh, extra ecclesia nulla salus. Basically, the, without outside the church there is no salvation and so church is very instrumental, especially the church which has a Roman Pope as its head. And uh, so they're quite, they emphasize this more exclusive attitudes towards others, that other people need to technically come and re rejoin, repent and rejoin the church, because there is only one true church, Catholic church. Now, in 1960s, 62, let's say, and to 65, during this council, church started to be open to a reflection and of God and God's truth and signs of sanctification outside the church. So they realize, okay, we are not the only ones who believe in Christ, who are honest Christians, who are faithful followers of Christ. So there are also others. So they coined the word, the Church of Christ subsists in Catholic Church. So by this, what I say, it subsists. It's not only exists as Catholic Church, which, which kind of uh, limits the confines of this body of Christ of this particular denomination or church. Um, but this is, it subsists, meaning that the body of Christ is much larger. We have the followers of Christ all over the place. Uh, some of them can be anonymous Christians, as, as Karl Rahner would say. Anonymous Christians meaning that even then themselves maybe they don't know that they're Christians. They maybe even didn't hear about Christ, but they're following God. They're following Holy Spirit. Everything that they know is true. They're following and they're being faithful to the measure of revelation that they have. Okay? So they, they're also called, you know, anonymous Christians. And so there is this kind of acknowledgement that the body of Christ is much wider category. But in some real sense, this body of Christ does, is manifested in Catholic Church. And then he, um, the text says in Article 8 of Lumen Gentium that uh, the elements of sanctification and truth are hidden also outside the Church. And the role of Catholic Church, church is to pull those elements and to bring them towards the uh, fuller truth. So this is this attempt to establish a better relationship to others, to admit that they also might be in a, on the same journey, but then we can learn from each other. It's already a big step for Catholic Church. And I think Adventists also did, did improve their attitudes in the last 50 years, um, before we were really regarded as a cult and as a sect. A sect is defined uh, as a community which has a very, um, well, divisive relationship in, in relation to the surrounding, surrounding environment 
environment. It lives in tension constantly. Yeah? But Adventism is becoming more balanced. Okay? So we see that our practice is being more balanced, but our theology is yet not updated. What about pioneers' effort to learn from, about the truth by learning from others? From Luther, they learn about what? Salvation, and then they revise this forensic theory. And yes, and then Anabaptists, we learned what? About Sabbath, Christian connection, yeah? Okay. There, there, there are also John Storrs, we learn about the state of the dead, yeah? P from Puritans, what did we learn? About sanctuary and the law of God, from reform movement and so on, covenant, theology. So, from Millerites, we have this eschatological orientation, Christ will come soon. So, Adventists really picked up a lot of things from the outside. So, they did not regard themselves as people who have everything, but people who are open towards the entire expression of truth, wherever it's found. Okay? If, even if it's found in the most unpredictable uh, places. So, this, they, they, they had this uh, attitude, we replace thousand, thousand lies for one truth. Okay, so this openness towards others, not only to tell them, they don't only engage with others to, to show them what the right way is, but also to learn from them. This dialogical relationship, that's something they had in the beginning, but uh, gradually it was lost because it was seen as a dangerous thing, because you lose your integrity, you lose your Adventist uh, identity if you really uh, do that, if you open up towards others to learn from them. Yes, it's uh, Exactly, as I was actually about to say that, the same thing. Uh, yes. I think in the beginning in our movement, we had that open, and that's how our movement get got yes. founded in some way, by yes. getting the, these precious truths and then coming together, and then this movement began, or initiated by God. Yes. But then, as we can see with Samir now, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I have experienced in some way, and I think unconsciously I've been shaped in that kind of way, mm -hmm. because I... I have uh, somehow begun with skepticism to look at other authors and to question, uh, okay, are they Adventists? If they're not Adventists, then I, should I really read this and shall I learn from them? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as we begin to learn through these, mm -hmm. obviously, two weeks, and, and obviously uh, God is working somewhere else, and uh, we need to be open to his movement yes. around us yes. so we can continue that journey that, that we've started uh, being yes. open in quest of truth yes. to still be open to, to God's work. Yes. And you can do that without, as, as Samir says, without losing your saltiness, without losing your character. Um, so this more inclusive attitude is possible. Okay, I have a, just a small demonstration of how this worked in the early church because this is the secret how, let's say, patristic fathers and, and apostles, how they were spreading gospel. They first analyze what's, what's out there, what the Holy Spirit was up to uh, before they even started to co have a conversation with the people around. They recognize very good elements in them. They, they drive towards good, you know. They recognize the work of the Holy Spirit and then they try to link this to Christ. So they were talking about early uh, church fathers like Ignatius and the, and the others. They were talking about uh, seeds of the truth which are hidden all over the place, everywhere in the world seed of truth even given to Greeks and Romans and Jews and different people and then um, God expect them to really take those uh, seeds of truth and put together and uh, and reveal the fuller truth in Jesus Christ so, okay so they not they did not really come there to critique necessarily but to affirm what's good and then build from that point and uh, therefore when Apostle Paul who was technically a Jew educated as a Pharisee but also had the knowledge about Greek culture because that's what the world, uh, Greek, Greek uh, shaped their mindset, but also he lived in the Roman Empire having, so to say, Roman passport citizenship. So here's a guy now functioning in three contexts from Jews. He learned about moral categories and uh, what's good and what's bad, so the way you live. And this was the main strife from Jews, not necessarily uh, the doctrines of God. You know, if you talk to Jews, they were, they're more concerned with how you behave, how you act. That's why it's even called monotheistic ethics you know and then um, the main thing is Torah for them or meaning meaning light light of moral discernment and you start to go to education from 6 to 10 memorizing Bible in Beth Sefer the, the, the house of the book and then if you are successful if you can memorize Torah a lot of verses 
if you should show the cap capacity, they upgraded to, to this um, bet Talmud from 11 to 15, technically um, where you are learning how to question. Uh, you are technically being asked something and then you answer with question, meaning that you are understood what you are asked and you are able to return and to give your own e input. At this stage Jesus was in a temple, you can remember that uh, scene, you know, showing his brilliance and people who show his, their brilliance from 11 to 15 years old, they are then upgraded, upgraded to this kind of higher education, uh, Bet Midrash, which technically um, is concerned for 15 years you start to uh, study how do you live, how do you imitate your teachers, how do you apply Torah or light, how do you live light. So first you you memorize things about it, then you think about it, internalize it, and then you live it. And those people on this rabbi level, once they finish their doctorate, they come to rabbi who was teaching them, and not everybody could qualify to really finish all, all those levels, so they ended up doing manual work. But those people who are able to go higher schools, they, they came to rabbi, and then rabbi in the end, when he thought that they are ready, then he technically announced them to be new rabbis, that they are also uh, the ones living Torah. Okay, the examples of how Torah should be lived. They're modeling themselves. So what happens usually in this process is that the person or student comes before the rabbi and then um, takes the dust from the ground next to, next to the feet of his rabbi and then put on his head, saying, okay, I will walk the same way, you know, I will live Torah, um, so I'll follow your steps. And... Uh, and then he's being upgraded to a teacher status, to rabbi status, and, he, and then he schools everybody else. But the whole idea of the whole educational system in, in a Jewish context is technically the idea of light. Moral discernment. discernment. How do we live Torah? But we can see on the other side, Greeks were not really interested in this practical domain so much. They were inter interested in intellectual categories about knowledge. You know, Plato, Aristotle, and in next week, in 10 days or whatever, we are going to Greece, you know, to Athens and to Corinth, and I'm going to have presentations there about this particular contribution of um, Greek mind to, the, to our civil civilization. So what do we get from Greeks? Um, and the main category for them is gnosis, gnosis or knowledge. And you achieve your full potential as human beings if you can think if you can think about your thinking, or think about your thinking about thinking, you know. So you're going into this abstract world and um, possibly those people had to be more well off to, be, uh, to afford this kind of lifestyle, to sit the whole afternoon and discuss philosophy and meaning, deep meaning of the universe. Um, and the more you can think in these abstract terms, the, the wiser you are. So they wanted to, get, to gain this enlightenment. They wanted to understand things, they wanted to gain knowledge. On the other side, Romans, they had, they had other drive. They gave us social categories or political categories. Everything was about status among them. So if you are a slave, what you long for is to be upgraded, to go to the higher class, which is technically a freedman. A slave, you don't own anything. You're a property. You're, you're not even regarded as human being, you know. Uh, but a freedman, you have some basic rights, okay? Nobody will necessarily exploit you, but you can't really buy things and possess yet and can, cannot influence the laws in a country. So your rights are still very limited. So you want to be plebe plebeians. Um, and those are people who are actually now uh, having a larger possession, employing other people and uh, have some input in laws. But if you manage to be patrician, like a consul or a judge, judge in a society, senator, okay? Those were actually the people creating law for others. They were involved in really, truly, this uh, representative system. This, uh, uh, they were voting and they were um, thinking about how, where do we want to go as a country. They were engaged with politics. So they are people actually making a difference in society. And they have property, they are wealthy people usually having their own great buildings and castles and so on. So they are climbing this ladder of glory, exousis. You know, they want to be more popular, to have a, a better decision-making process available, you know, so they can be engaged in this decision-making process. They, they want to be respected, they want to climb this social class ladder. So if you are born as a freedman, it takes sometimes few generations for you to upgrade. 
You can't just you know, decide to be something, no. It is a family thing. It takes something centuries from one family to, to grow this leather. And then, um, that's why for them, the statement that Christ was uh, on a top like a king, and he downgraded to be a servant. For them, it's like, why would somebody do that? When they read Philippians 2, 5 to 11, you go down to, be, to, to serve, to be a slave, but then there, there's a, the end of this uh, Christian hymn, which is found in, yeah, in Philippians 2, um, verses 5 to 11, when Christ is going to be exalted, given glory by God, and everybody then who connected to Christ there at that level is going to be upgraded. You know. So technically, Christ is your way to a higher status and respect and, real, and better social status. Okay, so here we go. Now we know three nations and their priorities. We know what they deal with, what drives them. You know, this is their passion. Is this passion bad or not? Is it bad to, to wish to know how to live a proper life, moral life, to have light? No. Is it bad to be thinking about knowledge and understanding things? No. Okay. Is it bad to wish that you have a normal relationship and, and that you can make decisions in society and influence the world around you? to have certain rights as, and dignity. No, it's not right. It's not wrong, I would want to say, yes. It's not wrong. So instead of critiquing those three systems completely fallen, you understand that the Holy Spirit has been engaged. He actually planted those desires in their hearts. You know, That's a divine gift. This is the seed of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to communicate this to those people, what you do is you find the language which appeals to them. And then you use this language to represent your experience of Christ, your knowledge of Christ. So this is the most efficient way of doing mission. In order to do that, you need to be more inclusive in your attitudes towards others. Not to reject them a priori. Not to say, okay, you're not worth to be, worthy to be a conversational partner with me. I'll tell you the way. No, this is not how you do these connections and this dialogue. But go at the same level, see what you can learn, what you can add to, the, to their knowledge. So this is how Apostle Paul did it. Demonstration. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, we are talking about how Christ is being shared in this multicultural, interreligious context. So we, we have the brilliant text, um, uh, which is found in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, what was that? Chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, For it is the Lord who said, let light shine out of darkness. So the, you have the illusion of, illusion of creation. Okay, so the same God who says, let it be light. He also said, let it be light, but in your heart. Who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What is he appealing to? Light, knowledge, glory. In one sentence, he managed to address them all, the entire population at that time. Okay, and imagine now, Jews who are searching how to get better light. The moment they hear the word light, you have their attention. And to claim that in the face of Jesus Christ, you find the ultimate revelation of God. You find the ultimate model how you should live Torah. He is the living Torah. He lives, you know, he shows you the light. So for Jews, the reference to light is very powerful. It affirms their project, but it enhances it. It advances it further. Now looking for Romans. There is somebody giving you glory, giving you this status. They, you are now king. You are royal priesthood. You have dignity. You have rights. And you have a particular significant role to play. Um, to Greeks, we learn that through Christ we can understand the, the mystery of universe, the mystery of God. So he's like a Mount Everest. You climb the, the highest hill and then you see from above the whole panoramic view. All the other mountains are there. So he brings you, by studying Christ's example and his words, you have the access to the ultimate meaning of the universe, to access to knowledge. Wow, this is why Apostle Paul was chosen to present the gospel to people outside, because he was able to speak language who other people can understand. He had this inclusive attitude towards others. He did not judge them necessarily. He just showed them what you're searching for, this unknown God, this value that you're searching, this drive, it's found in Jesus Christ. And then he focused the entire effort of showing them who, who that person is. How can they get knowledge? How can get this, they get glory and, and, and light through the example of Jesus Christ? That's why his message was appealing. 
So in the same way today, when we discuss our message, when we discuss our identity, we need to know who is around us. So what would you recommend to the church? What should we do to make our message more impactful? Let's say in capitalistic society or a secular age. Yeah, so what would you do? How would you pack the gospel in such a way? Yes? For me, I would just take myself like uh, I'm a chef. Mm -hmm. And I've got, a, I've got a party and I need to cook food for all my guests. There's some diabetic, uh -huh. some doesn't like spicy food, and some, you know, doesn't mm -hmm. like, you know, hot food. And so you have to cater them. So you mm -hmm. have to, to cook in a way that for all of them, uh -huh, uh -huh. So is that the idea, you know, with uh, the yes. Greek and the to, to know exactly which ingredients you need to give to what, to whom, mm. yeah? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, exactly. Powerful. Same thing, what, this is what John did, you know, Logos was something that everybody talked about. He took this as a legitimate project, as a leg legitimate context, uh, concept, but then he advanced it and said that Jesus is that Logos, yeah? What would you do? Yes. Paul Hubert in his book uh -huh. of, of contextualization as well, he speaks about the, the term of incarnation. Okay. Incarnating the gospel in human context. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's a very powerful thing to do because yes. we have this unidirectional mm -hmm. way of doing things. Like we do have the present truth. Yes. And then we're not willing to actually incarnate ultimate example is Jesus mm -hmm. in this sense you know you were talking about Paul but Jesus himself that's what exactly what he did by coming to this human yeah. loss right yes well, to reach us where we are mm -hmm. and speak in our language yes. and mingling with us pure incarnation yeah I had an issue with a um, postmodern guy who I met, whom I met randomly in the bus we ended up becoming good friends but he literally hates everything connected to religion, even the word God. It's so repulsive to him. And there is reason why that, why that is so. And um, so, technically, anytime that I would like to mention the word God, you can see this reaction in his face. Try to speak about God without using this particular imagery that person has. Then I realized, okay, maybe I can call him the, the Heavenly Father, or I could maybe use some other terms or some kind of force in the universe, you know, start with that and then build up um, that and so say that you can actually have the communication with this uh, ruach, with this pneuma. And we kind of, I was avoiding all the typical uh, parlance of Christianity, all the typical terms that we use to describe salvation and everything. And this takes time, this takes a lot of thinking. So how do I speak about God to avoid all those minefields in his mind, okay? How do I reach his mind? And then when I discover that actually he's a guy who wants to see it practically, that it works. I said, okay, let's start with prayer then. And if God, God gives him experiences, then he will understand that there is something here in your prayers. And I can see that in the last seven years how his life is being shaped. Without necessarily knowing the whole truth about God, he already participates in the life of God. Okay, and he can be guided in it, but it took a lot, a lot of effort uh, for that to put him in the right, right way, you know. Um, so this is... I think when you give Bible classes, you will soon discover that you can't present the same way, the same package to everybody. It's custom tailored. First, you need to know whom you're talking to, to know, to know what already drives that person. Once you find what's important for that person, for that particular person, it was freedom. How do you get freedom through Christ? And here we go, there is a whole Christianity can be a, a movement of freedom, okay, and freedom fighters. And um, so you can, Repackage. That's, that's the beauty of Christianity. It's, it has so many different angles and dimensions that you could use different metaphors, different ways of ex even explaining salvation um, and what Christ did. I know that for myself, the metaphor of kingdom of God and, as, and judgment of God, forensic metaphor, was not appealing at all. And I could not understand. I came here to study theology in England. I did study that, but somehow it just doesn't click with me. Then I did some self-analysis and then I realized that, um, well, I did grow up in Serbia during the war when there was no stable law and the justice system was perverted, so it's just a matter of who pays more. So they, um, and then kingdom was not as stable as, as uh, it was the, met it, in, in our head it's a synonym, synonym of corruption. 
because in war everybody's stealing from everybody, you know, and people using the power position to technically suppress the voice of those who don't have this power and to take the money and so on. So the whole concept was not attractive to me and um, it's always about how we defend ourselves against the government who always tries to find every opportunity to use you, to use your resources and to limit your rights for education, for who, who knows what, you know. So having this kind of experience, those metaphors were not appealing to me. Not even interesting at all. So I had to kind of force myself. Now that I live longer in England, and I learn about uh, certain aspects of a relatively stable system and how it functions and everything. This is becoming more appealing to me. The motto of Newbold is, uh, of Newbold Church is, um, we are here to extend the kingdom of God. You know, so this is seen through this particular vision. It appeals to people around because they live in a kingdom. They even have the queen. They can imagine this loyalty to a sovereign and so on. Yes. Can I ask, because I'm interested in reaching to unchurched young people, particularly mm -hmm. un uh, university yeah. students and around, mm -hmm. what, how can I connect with them? What kind of, uh, how do I? Uh, yes. What I, what I found useful is, you know, there are many Adventists and Adventism, like the leaders of church who critique postmodernism, something which is very bad. You know, everything is relative, everything is, but we forget that, that, that postmodernism brought also some good. Previously, we were emphasizing only knowledge and bra brain and reason as the avenue to, to truth. Well, postmodern says, no, we are much more than our brain. There is intuition. There is uh, symbolism. There is aesthetics. There is, you know, God speaks to our emotions also. Why are we so skeptical about it? You know, emotions have to be... On time? Yes, yes, and it's all about how you experience the space around you and God's presence is being kind of mediated through those avenues too. So they are extending and being closer to biblical concept of truth, which is Christ says, I am the truth, or community is the truth. And, you know, so it's, it's much more organic and human way of, of thinking. So we were slaves to certain enlightenment ideas, ideas of 20th century. But here we have the predisposition to understand the fullness of what the truth is. Of course, if you don't eliminate the rational element. Uh, so there is certain aspects of postmodernism in more constructive sphere, you know, that can be used actually to enhance our theology. The first wave of postmodernism was the constructionist wave, which is challenging everything that exists. But there, there are more reconstructionist uh, views later, more balanced to use. So there's a spectrum of opinions. So why not use those when you communicate truth? So when we talk about truth, it's not only, only about how you understand it, but also how you live it. So when you give Bible classes, you technically are starting to share your life, and then you are trying to think about how this improves your experience. How do you benefit from it? That's another thing, you know, important for consumerist mentality of today's world, you know. How do you benefit from this? You can still sell certain ideas through that particular mechanism, you know, emphasizing um, what's the signific significance from Sabbath, you know, of, of keeping Sabbath. The moment I switch my preaching from the topic such as Sabbath is the right day, not Sunday, this is the, my ultimate, you know, emphasis, in, uh, this was my emphasis, to was the more emphasis on what's the point of Sabbath, what's the purpose of it, how does it enrich your life. So then we talk this about physical rest on Sabbath. Sabbath means saying no to capitalism, no to workaholism, okay, that we don't live only for money. We are not only material beings, but we are also spiritual beings. We are something greater. Sabbath also gives you the orientation in space. Why? Because Sabbath reminds you about your origins, perfect origins, and you, are, you have dignified origins. You come from God, you know? And then also there, there is a whole vision of better future. So Sabbath reminds you on better past and better future, and therefore gives you the meaningful present. So there is uh, there's a whole generation which struggles with the idea of meaninglessness, you know, purposelessness, okay? So there is no purpose to my life. Now you have Sabbath, which reminds you regularly that you have the purpose, you have your good end, you know. Um, Sabbath, which reminds you that you're a relational being, that you have to stop, devote time to God and to other human beings. Ultimately, you're a relational being. So once I switch the language, you see, it starts to appeal to people around. Uh, because they can get benefit from it. they can experience the benefit, not only learn the benefit, but experience. So switching the language from 
understanding the word to living the world, the word of God, is very appealing in this postmodern context. So I would see many different elements in society around us which we can use as a door to enter and to establish this communication. For that purpose, we shouldn't be constantly on guard, in guard, guard position, you know, when we are defending ourselves against them, okay, the enemy. And then we should start open dialogue, not be afraid so much. And um, if you are rooted in Bible, if you have truth, truth will shine even brighter when you're surrounded by the world which is uh, not as bright, okay? So uh, if your truth is not solid truth, let it be replaced then. Challenge yourself, okay? So you better know, you know challenge, if, your, if your faith cannot survive the challenge, then it means that it wasn't good faith, it wasn't solid faith, okay? So maybe, of course, I would advise differently people who are only starting to learn and people who are like more, less mature in faith, you need to provide them with guidance. So I would not necessarily speak this way to them. I would show them, okay, this is how you live and this is the best you can offer them, you know. But you're master students, you're students who are going to think about where do we go as a church in the future, you're going to be leaders. And I think the encouraging the spirit of daring to, to communicate to others, actually to learn from others, is something which is positive. So by, this is what I mean by this. Change your attitudes, open yourself up to what God is doing in other nations, other religions, and then try to learn it, but not accept it without any filter. You see what I did with uh, communio ecclesiology? I evaluated different approaches and then I dismissed some of them because they were not biblical. So this is what we need to learn, the skill of critical analysis and comparing to our knowledge of scripture. Now we go into the third proposal, after adopting more inclusive attitudes towards others. The question of scope um, of mission is posed as, as well as the question of mode. So let's spend a few minutes, if the group here in the first line can read about the scope of ministry and the group behind about the mode of ministry for a few minutes, then we are going to discuss it briefly. There are questions on the side. Maybe when you start discussing, we would first read those questions. Okay. So, the moment, the moment we have uh, a better perception of what the Holy Spirit is doing around us, around the church, okay? That's the moment you need to think, okay, where is the Holy Spirit? Okay, and then this will in enhance our ministry. Um, Holy Spirit is not only hidden in the domain of religion. This is one realm that we are exposed to. There's different texts in the Bible saying that Holy Spirit kind of leads the whole earth, you know, and tries to regenerate the earth. And um, so there is this action of the Holy Spirit to maintain the life in the entire creation not only human domain. So, uh, what are the questions then for the proposal number three? Who would like to start with? Do, would, you like, would you mind reading the first question of uh, proposal number three? Okay. What can be done to have a Adventists recognize and participate in the spiritual movement in the domain of society, politics, ethnic, economics, culture, and ecology? So how does this change Adventist attitudes towards, let's say, what can be done to change Adventist attitudes towards politics, let's say? Why Adventists, let me just ask you a question before we answer this one. Why are Adventists usually socially conservative, you know, or maybe even say passive, not so involved? Because we think that God is coming, so if he's coming, why should we mm -hmm. get the earth? If it's, this is what you're asking, right? Yes, yes. So if he's coming soon and he's going to regenerate the whole earth, what's the point of trying to take care of the earth which will burn anyway? Okay, so it's going to burn anyway, so why bother then? Can't we, shouldn't we just focus on the main mission which is preaching the news? And there's also the talk of corruption. Mm -hmm. um, you getting involved in politics, uh -huh. you are kind of give, selling your soul. Yeah, because if you if you're to survive as a politician, that's a very corrupt world. Okay. Uh, mm. For some reason, we adopted this radical reform, reformers' legacy that church is for God and the society is, you know, under a secular authority. So there is no connection between. 
but uh, this came as a very um, one-sided view because the kingdom of God is everywhere around. So <laughs> everything belongs to God. So you, when early Christians, they, when they preached the message, Christ is our Lord, this is actually a politically subversive message, especially from the standpoint of Romans who were allowed to call the Lord uh, only Caesar. Caesar is the only Lord, the only one who, to whom you owe loyalty and who owns the kingdom, technically. So to say that there is some other Caesars, there is some other king, some other Lord, is politically controversial. So Christianity came also as a political movement. It's the statement about our loyalties. And we see Christ as the Lord of everything, the whole planet, everything was happening around. Now, it will happen sometimes that um, those two, the worldly kingdom and Christ's values, are somehow coinciding. And we are then invited to respect the, the government and to be loyal to that. But what if there is clashing between those two? Then we have to choose the priority of the Lordship of Christ. Yeah. So ultimately, this is, our gospel has political implications. If you want it or not, if you admit it or not, it does have political implications. We can't be as invisible in the current world, as uninvolved, you know. We, we are here to actually be agency of good, to speak for, on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves, to speak on behalf of marginalized people who are disprivileged, people who are poor and somewhere there in a corner of society, and they, they don't have anybody to defend them. Because we believe in just kingdom, in the value of every human being, we cannot allow those. So we need to technically be involved in nonviolent initiatives that try to pro propagate those positive values. As, as well as values protecting the earth, the goodness of creation. Because this is the value. There is a, uh, our nature has a very high goal and purpose, as is human being, to be a sanctuary of God. So if, as God's sanctuary, we have a responsibility towards it. It's actually description and task given to Adam and Eve. Avad and Shamar, keep and protect, serve and protect this, uh, this sanctuary. So this is the man mandate for us also to protect the world of God because this is a sanctuary when God wants to dwell. So, okay, that's one another reason, separation between secular and spiritual realms. Yeah, Babylon thing, so this is all corrupted and, yeah. The Bible also says, I think, you know, in James 4, verse 4, mm -hmm. you adulterous people, do, do you not know that friendship with the world Mm -hmm. is enmity with God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, they probably use this kind of uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. verses, misread, misapplication, mm -hmm. you know, separate themselves from the world. And yes. So, there, there are technically a lot of different texts in the Bible which points or appear, uh, they appear to point in, in, in one direction. But then Jesus says, you live in the world, but you're not from the world. So you don't, you don't imitate the worldliness, not, you do not imitate the corruptive aspect of it. But you still live in the world. You are political agents also, as a political body, especially now when the community is more than 20 million. But you can't completely be uninterested in what's happening around you. Okay. I, I yeah. can give a quick, quick example. For example, even Moses was a great leader. Mm -hmm. However, you know, the priest of Midian, which was Jephro, mm -hmm. at that time the father-in-law, had to come and counsel Moses mm -hmm. to give counsel to those Israelites. Yes. And how beautiful was that? Even God was using, yes. you know, through his spirit, somebody who is outside in yes. Midian, you know, priest at that time. Yes. And also you could see Joseph, for example. Yes. God used different nations to bring Joseph there. Yeah. And even with the temple, why Islam, or why temple at the moment, the, the place where the temple is, that belongs to Muslim now. Mm -hmm. the, God has been using the Muslim for the sacrifice to stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so God is using everywhere into the world as well. So. Yeah. And opening them up to that movement actually is a radical thing sometimes. You, you won't be understood. Uh, but I, uh, for this point, you know, uh, without necessarily going now deeper in this particular uh, proposal, I would recommend the article written by Rock, uh, Calvin Rock, and I uploaded it in your Moodle, who talks about uh, church and society. 
And then this guy, uh, who was asked by General Conference to write about our relationship to the world outside, he, he analyzed different theological reasons. Why do we have this hesitance, you know, and different historical reasons and different, you know, to, to understand why do we think certain way. And, and um, then he gives his proposal how this could be improved. But my proposal is that what improves it, when, once you realize that God, God is involved in this society, it's his kingdom, it's the domain of his reign, this provides then the platform for your political action. Um, Holy Spirit is involved. He wants to propagate those values which are um, appreciating human beings and, and bringing tolerance as well as, as respect of another human being and so on. So we as his agents also have to be part of that movement of Holy Spirit. So the work of Holy Spirit extra ecclesia, outside of the church, is the foundation for us to reconsider our the theology and to see, okay, things are much more complex and if we really want to fulfill our role on the earth while waiting for Christ to come, we do need to be partners with God. We need to, we need to participate in His work. And this leads us then to the mode of, the, uh, of ministry. Uh, currently we are emphasizing proclamation as the primary mode. You preach the message. And here I, I have a proposal, development of more communal and relational modes of outreach. What does that mean? What are the questions that you have there? in um, uh, group number four. Is the church to be understood as God's temporary means slash instruments that accomplishes his purposes or as an end in itself? Do you understand the question? Is the church something which will pass? Uh, is it just an instrument for God to achieve something? Or is it end in itself? Once everything stops, the church will remain. And that's the point of what God is doing everything. So what do you think is the right answer? Is the church an instrument of God or an end in itself? So let, let's explore both, both proposals. If church is the instrument, then church is used here, let's say, to preach to the world so the world can then be restored. Once it's restored, there is no point of having a church. Yes, yeah, it has a particular function which will expire, let's say. Let's say preaching to the unconverted or, you know, mission. This seems to be obsolete when it comes uh, in the future. Uh -huh. Oh, it's slightly different, slightly different this one. This one is okay. Oh, yeah, you're right, yes. Um, does God want church to be just temporarily used and he raised this community for a particular purpose? Once this purpose is achieved, then we don't need the church anymore. Because otherwise, otherwise we can just become public churches, you know? Uh -huh. To get people to convert and give out uh -huh. things all the time and pop and leave again. Okay. I think mm -hmm. it would be a place where people can come for a longer period and can find like friendships and, and family and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, then, then using it as an instrument Okay, so in that sense, there is negative connotation to be, it should be an end in itself. But if you see it as a purpose, let's say, we, like Apostle John says, we preach this gospel to you so that you can have koinonia. So it turns out to be actually the point. The point of everything is God wants to develop a relationship, technically, and to dwell in His people and they, they dwell in Him. That seems to be the end goal of God, okay? So church is not some instrumental peripheral thing, but it's essential for God's plan and it will continue to exist forever, then we can say, yes, this is the end itself. Um, but also church is an instrument because this community is then being used also as a mission. And this is where we come to this point that there is a way of doing mission without necessarily using so, much, so many words, okay? Uh, by demonstrating what it means to be koinonia, by being the church. And this for postmoderns post is much more powerful way of mission. They want to feel loved, they want to love and be, and be loved in return, yeah. They want to experience uh, this relational culture that they have identity somewhere, you know, grounded. That they can find fulfillment, they can grow together. It appeals to modern people, postmodern people. So creating communities which, are, which have this kind of relational emphasis is already a mode of ministry, relational churches. 
and uh, creating friendships and deepening those friendships on, and being authentic, being open, is the model ministry also. Uh, not only what you say and what you do, but also who you are as community. You want to add something, Spasse? You said it, but are you just saying that we we should we ought not to just go out there and stand somewhere and then speak yeah. like this is you know God is love and you know God is justice and God is peace? Are you trying to say that we need to think of where how to come to these people and mm -hmm. form relationships with them, and then instead of saying God is love, demonstrate that to the to in their lives through that relationship that we form instead of saying just god is peace from shouting it heralding it yes we need to bring peace in their lives to calm their stones in yes. a sense yes I mean, that works for everyone doesn't it if someone would be standing on the corner and is shouting something completely different than what i believe it, it wouldn't necessarily speak to me whatsoever or just like when people give me like pamphlets yeah I don't really look at pamphlets at all. So mm -hmm. I'm always thinking, if it doesn't work for yourself, why would you, like, why yeah. would that be the only way? Because it, it worked for some people, it really does. Yeah, yeah. But why would you use that as your only way of reaching people? Yeah, and, and this, this model is, is totally new paradigm shift as Leo uses this mm -hmm. word. Because I find it quite amazing. Because mm -hmm. this kind of thinking, it takes a whole life approach, whole life participation. Yes. It, it's instead of just using cognitive ability to transmit yes. an information. And I, I think it's a... Look at what Jesus did. He technically lived with them. He ate with them. He did ministry with them. He was teaching. So you can see the shared life being the category of... Mini, 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 and people are changed through this, through sharing life. Not necessarily just to, from hearing information. There's this com community in Northampton, uh, not Adventist one, but you know, in 1960s and 70s, there was a big revival in the, mid, in the middle of England, you know. And then um, those people experienced Holy Spirit and uh, they, they started to be very close. And people from other towns, they were coming to the chapel, Balbrook Chapel, you know. And uh, technically this was a church where a young pastor came and there were old ladies there and church was kind of on the verge of, an ex of its extinction. So they started to pray for revolution, and things started to happen. Holy Spirit demonstrated His presence, and there were a lot of signs and miracles, and this attracted the attention of people who were hungry to experience God, they were, who were hungry to go beyond uh, just a rational you know, explanation of religion. They wanted to actually have this unmediated, direct, direct experience of the Holy Spirit. So they were traveling from different towns together around this chapel. Okay? And I went to visit this chapel, and uh, so the story is fascinating, technically. So what happened is uh, they could not fit in all those people in a small room. So they had these multiple services. They had trying to open the windows, so people outside were standing and watching. This was sudden interest, like hundreds and hundreds of people coming. They heard about it from different towns, and they wanted to see themselves what's happening. And then those people, they were reading Acts of Epistles, and they realized, okay, these Acts, they, 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 they feel that they want to share the whole life. They are there anyway. They were coming there for long periods and having this friendship. So they said, okay, let's sell, let, let's sell everything that we have. Let's sell everything and then live together. Have a common purse. So now this is a very hard thing for those people who are well, uh, well off because they will say that it costs them much more than people who don't have, you know. Um, but they still did it. It's a risk. What happens later, you know, once you sell it, if it doesn't work out, if they pull out from this community, you are left on the street. But they, without any reservations, they enter that. And um, so now they realize, okay, we need to make money somehow. So we need to do it together. So they bought these houses that they lived in, in communities. Around 600 of them live today there in England. So it's not only Amishes in America, but this community is very contemporary, very open to the world, but they live together and demonstrate these relationships. They're particularly specializing for people who are on the margins, you know, people who have certain addictions or don't have fathers and so on. So they take them in community and just allow them to live, to share life together. And then naturally worship God, they're, you know, reading the Bible. And then those people are starting to accept this culture of the church, God-centered culture. 
and then converted, converting. So they, they have some radical things that they're doing. They sometimes go to the town, let's say they went to Sheffield, or, and they go there and then they pray to God, what should I do? And then they have this prophetic voice saying, okay, go and play basketball. So they, they go and play basketball, and then the, the occasion comes uh, that they, they're interacting with those people around and they're people asking about God and they could witness and then they convert people and they create this Jesus uh, centers of influence. That's how they call it. And um, or they go to London and they, they, were there, they went to the gay club in Soho Square. Uh, and then they offered to uh, wash their, their feet, like what Jesus said, and to get, offer Holy Communion in gay club. Ooh, this was a very radical thing, you know, many Christians even now would excuse that. Um, but people who were in the bar, they were so shocked that those holy people who believe in Christ actually want to mingle with them and to be, you know, to, to come there and to wash their legs as a sign of hum humility and that they were so impressed that they wanted to know more about this community. And then they inquired more about what they believe and then they want to join the community. So they're opening centers like crazy everywhere around. And I happened to meet, meet those people, I think providentially also. I went to, I thought this is a kind of academic conference. It says there a koinonia or something, it was like in the title. So I was studying this and I said, okay, let me just see what's happening there. I went there and then I realized their church meeting, okay. We became friends and, and we are often in touch now. I learned so much about this way of sharing gospel. So what they do is they're not obsessed with trying to sound correct, you know, and, and just placing the doctrine, speaking at you. They just invite you to share life with them. This seems to be working. This seems to be working in 21st century. What they did actually, they organized their own ministries. They call it kingdom businesses. Let's say healthy food, good foods, the, the, the brand, it comes from them. Uh, they offer it, they, they, they are cultivating apples there or having their farms or being their uh, carpenters and so on. So uh, what's happening is that they are sharing the entire life together. It's a whole life participation in community, and then this becomes the mode of ministry, not only your words. So I think this, this is where we can learn as Adventists. We are not only a community which shares the same beliefs. We come to the church, we discuss our faith, but we share the entire life. Once we do that, people will be drawn to that. Intuitively, they will feel that this is something they are created for, to be persons in a relation. This is what I, mean, what I mean, that we need to enhance the mode of ministry to, re, to have this relational aspect. Um, and in this way, we are opening up our building, cons consisting of all those doctrines and messages, by extending the scope of our ministry, by changing the models of ministry, mode of ministry, mode of delivery, attitudes towards others, and perspective of ministry. So we are doing that, and in this way, I believe Adventism, Adventism achieves its goal, its mission in the world. We are opening the windows. If you don't do that, our, our air is going to be smelly. It's going to, we're going to breathe in each other's air. But if you learn how to do those four proposals in practice, if you think about the implications of it, you will see how this is actually opening us towards others and making our witness efficient. In this way, we can supplement the vision of remnant, including all those other avenues. Yes, Samir? Why did you put attitude in uh, orthodoxy? Because oh, okay, okay. At the moment, I just place them as in, in the place of windows oh, and doors. You might find a different attitude up there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It was a bit confusing. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, let's say this doesn't make, um, need to be in particular order. Um, but what you can do is now you have certain kind of um, the essence of those four proposals captured on those pages. But still, the, all the implications of it, how will I now do my ministry? So, how to questions. You can spend time thinking about it. Maybe in your reflective paper, you can send some suggestions, you know, or in your, even in your uh, academic blog, you can explore those implications further. Um, but for now, what, what my goal of this class was just to outline the potential areas where you can continue to work on improving our existing ecclesiology. And if you, if you, at least you know, uh, maybe you won't be able to necessarily use immediately everything, but at least you know what are the areas, crit what critical areas are there, and your practice will actually force you to come in this particular domain also, to see, okay, we need to change something, otherwise people are not coming to the church, our message is not being heard, we are not progressing in our knowledge of truth, things are not happening. Why? Because we closed, we shut all the doors and windows around us. 
Okay? So this is my invitation uh, that understanding the work of the Holy Spirit and mission in this particular sense that this is a whole life participation in a mission of God who is trying to restore this defected world. This whole life participation in the mission of God, in the mission of the Holy Spirit and Christ leads us towards those four proposals. And this is how I imagine the emerging perspectives in our vision of ministry. This is those four areas we can discuss. Okay, you have break for 10 minutes, and then after we, we are starting with a class on churchless spirituality. And then we have the, after that class, we will have uh, a conclusion and recommendations for further study.